Our text this morning requires some additional context. After King David ruled Israel, his son Solomon took the throne. And history remembers him fondly. Solomon built Israel into the formidable nation that it was in the ancient Levant before endless wars and conquests would dictate the rest of its history. The trouble begins with Solomon's son, Rehoboam. He lacks his father's renowned wisdom, and his lust for wealth and power will condemn his kingdom to division, rebellion, and civil war, splitting the nation into two, north and south, never to be whole again. This text is about Israel, but it could easily be about our country, too. A reading from 1 Kings. Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the older men who had attended his father Solomon while he was alive, saying, How do you advise me to answer this people? They answered him, If you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. But he disregarded the advice that the older men gave him and consulted with the young men who had grown up with him and now attended him. He said to them, What do you advise me that we answer this people who have said to me, Lighten the yoke that your father put on us? The young men who had grown up with him said to him, Thus you should say to this people who spoke to you, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you must lighten it for us. Thus you should say to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. Now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Please play with, pray with me. Everlasting God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon all of our hearts serve to glorify you, and may they be in keeping always with the teachings of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. While I was visiting some friends in Connecticut a few months ago, I noticed an odd trend in the billboards along I-95. You see, some of the local personal injury lawyers appear to be engaged in some kind of marketing feud. Carter Mario, a well-established presence in Hartford, rents out a lot of billboards that feature his tagline, Get Carter. He's always wearing a suit, of course, looking very professional, and I see plenty of his billboards as I'm driving. But a bit further down the highway, I start seeing ads from Brooke Goff, a younger, hipper attorney. Her billboards feature her in a leather jacket, her blonde hair short and coiffed, apparently taunting Carter's older, more conservative image. The words, get smarter, (laughs) are emblazoned above her. Now, driving a little further on, I can see that Carter Mario, not to be outdone by this young upstart, rents out some more billboards. Only now he's wearing a leather jacket, too. And he's riding a motorcycle with the words, We Ride, boldly printed beneath the usual Get Carter tagline. I can't help but notice that personal injury attorney John Heyman is also getting in on the action with yet more billboards featuring him wearing a leather jacket and sitting astride his chopper. Another half mile or so down the road, I see that Brooke Goff has managed to troll them both. In response to Carter Mario and John Heyman's attempts to look cool, the last billboard before my exit features Goff in a hot pink business suit, also with a motorcycle. Above her, the words, do we ride? Who cares? 
are printed in large, unfriendly letters. Who cares? At this point, it's become clear that it's less about appealing to new clients and more about trying to outdo and insult each other. The billboards are funny, but they remind me that some folks don't even try to be polite anymore. Why have Americans become so mean? asks writer David Brooks in a recent article in The Atlantic. I was recently talking with a restaurant owner, he writes, who said that he has to eject a customer from his restaurant for rude or cruel behavior once a week, something that never used to happen. A head nurse at a hospital told me that many on her staff are leaving the profession because patients have become so abusive. At the far extreme of meanness, hate crimes rose in 2020 to their highest level in 12 years. Murder rates have been surging, at least until recently. Same with gun sales. Social trust is plummeting. In 2000, two-thirds of American households gave to charity. In 2018, fewer than half did. The words that define our age reek of menace. Conspiracy, polarization, mass shootings, trauma safe spaces. I don't think Brooks is wrong. That hostility is certainly rife in our politics, but it seeps into everything else too, doesn't it? People lose their temper and get into fights over parking spots or misplaced orders at the drive-thru. Teenage pranksters on TikTok compete for views and likes by assaulting strangers at the shopping mall, throwing a pie in their face or pulling a chair out from behind someone at the food court. Bomb threats are made at high schools, several just across the street this year. Swastikas are painted on synagogues that have to hire security for worship services. And now Islamophobia is on the rise again on account of the latest war. Apparently Muslim teens at Glenbard West have been ridiculed in public as of late while walking to school. We've got elected officials and their kids posing with assault rifles in their family Christmas photos. It's all indicative of a mean-spirited culture. We are enmeshed in some sort of emotional, relational, and spiritual crisis, Brooks writes, and it undergirds our political dysfunction and the general crisis of our democracy. What is going on? Well, I'm curious as to how Brooks answers his own question, but that was far as I could get in the article before I hit a paywall. Since I'm too cheap to buy a subscription, this sermon is an attempt to answer it myself. It's a little bit like when I was a kid and I wanted a toy that I wasn't allowed to have, so I'd try to fashion my own version out of cardboard and duct tape. Results varied. As such, the usual caveats apply here. These are just my observations and opinions, which you're free to disagree with. You may even disagree with the premise itself, but let's assume for the sake of argument that there's some truth to it. Why have some Americans become so mean? Those billboards reflect something, I think, about our cultural values. Older, established norms of our social contract seem to be giving away to something more aggressive more hostile. And to quote an essay I recently read, for some reason, a lot of it focuses on recompense for perceived personal injury. A lot of folks are feeling disenfranchised and desperate. And while it's true that some may be playing a victim card, there are plenty of folks who are suffering genuinely from systemic injustice. The cruelty is the point is a phrase I hear often when people talk about certain policies, or politicians they disagree with. I'm sure the Israelites said that about King Rehoboam, and they were not wrong. He was a horrible leader. His father, Solomon, was regarded as a wise and powerful ruler who built the temple in Jerusalem, among other vast infrastructure projects that expanded the reach and influence of the nation. Solomon founded, uh, funded building projects all over Israel, from 
hospitals and temples to administrative centers and aqueducts and housing developments and trade routes. Necessarily, Solomon had to raise taxes to pay for it all. And while people probably weren't all that happy about that, they could at least see that it was all being invested in public goods. By the time Solomon dies, Israel is thriving. It's, it's living in a golden age. Jerusalem has grown tremendously along with its economy and the well-being of her people. And now that those investments in society are beginning to pay off, the people beg their new king, Rehoboam, to lower their taxes. But rather than heed the advice of his elders or the will of the people, Rehoboam decides that he's going to raise taxes even further. And rather than invest it in public goods, it's pretty clear that the king means to keep it for himself. I will add to your yoke, he tells the people of Israel. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. The cruelty is the point. Solomon invested in public goods and services, agriculture, infrastructure, education, green spaces, libraries, roads, the things that help societies to thrive. But Rehoboam only invests in himself. Under Solomon, things were not perfect, but there was at least a sense of mutual progress, a kind of uh, mutual dream that people were working towards. There were common goals. People were willing to sacrifice something for the greater good. But under Rehoboam, there is only scarcity and fear and desperation that ultimately leads to violent uprisings and civil war that tear the kingdom in half, never to be whole again. And sometimes it feels like we're on that same precipice. A lot of folks are feeling desperate, angry, looking for scapegoats to blame and demagogues to follow. I fear that our much celebrated rugged individualism combined with a lack of investment in public goods, education, healthcare, housing, that kind of thing, has left everyone feeling like they have to fend for themselves. Some of them get desperate. Some of them get me. As long as I've got mine, who cares? In the uh, brilliant and dark comedy, Idiocracy, a man volunteers to be cryogenically frozen for one year as part of a military experiment. But due to bureaucratic mismanagement, he wakes up 500 years later to find that his fellow Americans have become increasingly self-centered, violent, and dumb. In one scene, a mother is trying to buy food for her children at a Carl's Jr. fast food kiosk. The machine takes her money but gives her nothing in return. She kicks it, frustrated, at which point the kiosk sprays her with some kind of gas that knocks her out. You are an unfit mother, it says in its robotic voice. Your children will be placed in the custody of Carl's Jr. Have a nice day. And then it repeats the corporate slogan, Carl's Jr., screw you, I'm eating. Except it didn't say screw. <laughs> the ads and slogans that we are bombarded with are not quite that nasty, but I feel like we're getting there. I keep seeing ads on Facebook for these terrible t-shirts, especially around holidays like Mother's Day or Valentine's Day. They're, they're very tacky and they're crammed with way too many words, but I want to read a couple of them to you. I am a lucky daughter. I have a crazy dad who happens to cuss a lot. He has anger issues and a serious dislike for stupid people. You hurt me, and they'll never find your body. I was raised by an awesome mom. She's a bit crazy and scares me sometimes, but she loves me so much. If you mess with me, she'll punch you in the face very hard. Sorry, ladies, I'm married to an awesome wife. She's a bit crazy and scares me sometimes, but she is a perfect mixture of sunshine and hurricane. If you mess with me, 
The beast in her will awaken, and they'll never find your body. What's with all the bodies? Why the need to punctuate compliments of our loved ones with death threats? As to why I'm always seeing ads for these online, I don't know. I, I opted out of targeted advertising, so maybe I get ads for the stuff that no one else wants. I don't know. I turned off the tracking algorithm after I watched the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 on Netflix and started getting ads for chainsaws the next day on Amazon. <laughs> as if daring life to imitate art. Well, maybe not art, per se. But if I watch Rambo or John Wick, will I start seeing ads for guns, too? Whenever there's a mass shooting, like the one in Maine last month, and just to remind you all, there have been 565 such incidents this year. A predictable argument ensues. The left blames easy access to guns, and the right blames mental illness. But those are symptoms of a deep, deeper sickness, not underlying causes. I think the truth is more complicated. Today, the average family is struggling. 63% of households can't afford a $500 emergency. Wages haven't kept pace with inflation. Housing costs a fortune, and every trip to the grocery store feels a little bit more painful than the last. Single income households are mostly a relic of the past and childcare costs are exorbitant. Meanwhile, we're drowning in advertisements for things that we don't need, reminding us of everything that we don't have. And in order to make sure we keep looking at these ads, keep generating those clicks, we're fed a steady diet of outrage. Each of us drafted into this never ending culture Bowling League, civic organizations, and church communities have been slowly replaced by social media, the infernal engine that keeps this vicious cycle turning. Here, folks are duped by fake news on X. Young people develop eating orders on Instagram, and aimless, angry young men are radicalized by incel groups on 4chan. Meanwhile, the town square is empty. Loneliness and fury are epidemic, and yes, there is also mental illness, and yes, there are also guns. Lots of guns. Friends, this is a blueprint for tragedy. It's the architecture of aggression. None of this is indicative of a healthy society, much less the American values that people have long fought and died for. And we can do better. Some people claim that America is a Christian nation. I'm not going to unpack that statement, but based on what I know about Jesus, and not to brag, but I know a lot about Jesus. <laughs> a Christian nation looks like the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, we take care of the poor and the sick. We invest in the common good. We prioritize people over profits. We temper justice with mercy. We turn swords into plowshares, and we strive for equality and justice for all. We don't bankrupt people with medical bills or take away school lunches from kids or force 10-year-old girls to carry pregnancies to term or make folks so desperate that they feel like they have to take their own life or a couple dozen other lives on their way out. I recently read a fascinating article called uh, Structures of Coercion, the Psychogeography and Politics of Oppressive Architecture. The author writes about how spaces are sometimes designed to be cruel. Refugee detention centers, prisons, industrial warehouses, even office buildings are often built to be cold and inhospitable. Park benches are constructed with just enough unnecessary protrusions to make sleeping on them impossible. Brutalist styles are especially prevalent among administrative buildings and housing projects, which look more like bunkers and mausoleums than a nice place to work or call home. But architecture is really just the physical manifestation of our social contract. 
our collective ethos, the infrastructure of our relationships and our public life. And much like the physical infrastructure that undergirds our nation, our aging electrical grids and creaking bridges, I really worry that our relational architecture is crumbling too. I worry that we've lost our sense of community. I, I see desperate, angry, lonely faces. I can see it in people's eyes everywhere I go, everywhere but here. This congregation does a fine job of taking care of this old, beautiful building, repairing the cracks, fixing the leaks, even replacing the roof when it's necessary. But more importantly, you all care for the architecture of our community, our relationships, our purpose, our mission. If you're struggling, someone will lend you a hand. If you're grieving, someone will walk with you. If you want to sing, you've got a place in the choir. If you want to serve, there's always a need. If you just want to eat, there's always a place at the table. Just last night, folks welcomed each other into their homes for our annual progressive dinner, and everyone brought something to share, even if it was only a baguette. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's what I brought last night. <laughs> brought a baguette from Trader Joe's. But people also shared things about themselves that they normally don't because they felt safe. The world needs more places like this, sanctuaries where community is alive and well, where it doesn't matter how many ads we click on, places where people listen instead of just spewing outrage, places where we see each other in person, face to face, places where folks are kind and compassionate and strive to love as Jesus did, places that make a cynical curmudgeon like me believe in humanity again. So take this place, friends, and bring it with you everywhere you go. This is more than a church. It is a blueprint for the kingdom of God. Who cares? We care. Amen.